Now, in your Bibles today, I'm looking in Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew chapter number 17. Lord willing, we'll begin reading at verse number 1. The Bible said, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If I will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and, and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, uh, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they uh, fell on their face and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they did lift up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Our fathers, we come to you today. Will you help us as we look into the Word of God and use this message for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we come to the account in the Bible of transfiguration. And we come to the account when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John into a high mountain to be transfigured before them. And as he was, uh, Moses and Elijah, or Elias here in our text, Elijah, and this represented the prophets and the law. Now these men literally appeared in that day. Notice what they were doing. They were talking to Jesus. They did not talk to the disciples. They talked to the Lord. Every word in the Bible is important in how God words things in the Bible. <laughs> so they talked to the Lord. But while they were there, Peter, James, and John could see Moses and Elijah. And Peter, James, and John, Peter got a little carried away. And Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now what Peter was doing by accident is that Peter was putting... Um, Peter was putting Jesus on the level of Moses and Elijah. Peter was putting us back under the law. That's what he was doing. Now, uh, the Bible said that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. The law came by Moses. And so uh, it represented the law and the prophets here talking with Jesus Christ. I believe that they were talking about, uh, 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 um, I believe they were talking about Calvary. Now, notice again what Peter said. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here. Now, he's getting ready to uh, say something here. Uh, let us make here three tabernacles. Now, of course, there's only one place for Jesus Christ. One for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Well, that wasn't God's will. Now, the Bible said on down at the end of this that we read, the Bible said that they saw no man save Jesus only. After, after everything was done, and Jesus come by and touched them, they were so afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, the Bible said they saw no man save Jesus only. And Moses wasn't there. Elijah wasn't there. They saw no man save Jesus. Now, in this hour of grace, now we're not under law. Now, that does not mean we throw our Old Testament away. That's not what we're saying at all. But we're not under law. We're under grace. And what uh, the, the whole point of this message is this, when Jesus is most important, amen? When, in other words, when, when Jesus is the only thing that matters. Now, you see, in Peter's life, Peter was so excited about seeing Moses and Elijah that, that Peter put them up there with Jesus. But then, when the Lord was transfigured, and then the Lord touched Peter, and Peter lifted up his eyes, he saw no man save Jesus only. You see, Jesus became most important to Peter. Now, do you remember in Isaiah uh, chapter number 6, the Bible said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Somehow, God had to remove Uzziah from Isaiah's eyes. 
And, and I believe the indication of the scriptures there, I believe it implies that Uzziah was standing in the way of Isaiah's growth. Now, maybe not Uzziah was doing it, but more Isaiah was doing it. And I think sometimes we get our eyes on men, on people, on family, on things, on churches, and it stands in the way of our growth. We need to come to the place in our Christian life to where that Jesus is the only one that matters. And I want to preach on this subject today, when Jesus is the only one that matters. When you begin to look and realize that Jesus could now that don't mean that you forsake everybody, not have anything to do with everybody. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But what I'm talking about is when Jesus is the main object of your life. When you live for Him, when all you want to do is His will and His Word, and, and when you do that, you'll get somewhere. You remember in the garden, Jesus prayed, Not my will, but thine be done. You remember that? I, I, I've often said this, that when our will becomes His will, we'll get something done. Amen? So I want to look at a few people in the Bible today that the Lord was, was uh, the only thing that mattered to them. Amen? First of all, I think about Mary. I think about Mary. Mary learned from Him. Mary learned from the Lord. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter number 10, we have a little story here about Mary and Martha. And the Bible says in verse number 38, Now it came to pass, uh, the Bible says, As they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And uh, she had a sister called Mary, the Bible said, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Verse number 40 says, But Martha was cumbered about uh, much serving, and came uh, to him and said, Lord, dost uh, thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Then this is what Jesus said to Martha in verse number 41, Luke chapter number 10. The Bible said, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Uh, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now here's the thing. Mary was sitting at his feet learning. He had two sisters. They invite Jesus into their house. Martha does. And so Martha's wanting to make sure all the plates are right. Whatever color spoons they're going to use. Whatever whatever they're going to do. The color of the tablecloth. She's worried about things that don't even matter. Now Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet learning. When you see somebody sitting at Jesus' feet in the Bible... It denotes learning. Remember the man in Mark 5 sat at his feet? The man learned something because he went out. Jesus sent him out to witness for him uh, in Decapolis. And so he learns. Then remember Paul sitting at the feet of Gamaliel? Sitting at somebody's feet means they were learning. Now Mary was learning the Word of God. Which is more important, serving or learning? Now let, let, me, let me just say this, and I want to say it carefully. I believe in ministry. I believe in being busy. I believe in a man working. I've wasted a lot of time in my lifetime. But I'm going to say this to you. Our churches today are filled with ministry, ministry, ministry. Busy, busy, busy. And the more busy you are, the more spiritual you are. I'm going to say to you, that is not true. There, there are times in your life that you need to set at Jesus' feet. There are times even in your life as a preacher and a pastor that you need to get away and you need to learn the Bible. You need to get by yourself and you need to learn what the Bible says. You don't need to quit learning. Now you can zap your battery dry by always ministering, ministering, ministering and never learning, learning, learning from the Bible. Now here's Mary. Mary sets at his feet. You know what happened there? Mary uh, when she got acquainted with Jesus, he's the only one that mattered. When Jesus is the only one that matters. Now, in Martha's life, Jesus wasn't the only one that mattered. Uh, Jesus mattered, but the plates mattered. The cups mattered. The spoons mattered. The tablecloth mattered. The food mattered, you see. Now, now listen, I'm not saying be careless. I'm not saying do a half job. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying this. When Jesus becomes the object of your life, you'll learn from Him. Amen. You'll learn what He wants you to do. I'm afraid many people serve the Lord and, and they go about serving God in their own way. And we have become mechanical. We've become, we, we know all the ins and outs. We know all the right words. We know all the, the service and, and we invent. i tell you what we're doing today. And we're, we're, we're marketing instead of 
uh, uh, instead of ministering. Amen. And 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 we're we're trying to do something that the Lord's not in a lot of times. And brother, let me just say this to you: we ought to learn. When Jesus becomes most important to you, you're going to take time. You're going to slow down. The Bible said, be still and know that I am God. If I could say one thing to you young preachers, the best thing you can do is not worry about ministry, ministry, ministry all the time. But the best thing you can do is, is be still and wait upon the Lord. Now, when you're being still, that, that don't mean that you sit idle and that you play video games. It means that you get in the Word of God. It means you get on your knees. You say, preacher, I don't have any places to preach. All right, get on your knees and pray. That's what I've been doing. Just pray. Boy, I tell you, the door's open when you pray. Amen. One fellow told one of them old preachers, he said, I need a break. The fellow said, no. The old preacher said, you don't need a break, son. You need God. Amen. And so what, what needs to happen is when Jesus is the only one that matters, you begin to learn. Now, Mary learned some things. And, and, and the Bible said that Mary hath chosen that good part. Amen. Part of living life is fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we think that we got to get it all done. I, I, I want to say this. God hasn't called one church to get it all done. God has not called one ministry to get it all done. God has not called one preacher to get it all done. Why, dear preacher, if God wanted you to do everything, He just called you and left the rest of us alone. Amen. And so we all have our own things that God has us to do. We all have our place in the work of God. We're all in the body of Christ. My liver does not do the work of my eye. My leg does not do the work of my thumb. My tongue does not do the work of my ears. Amen. And so we all have our place. And so Mary chose that good part. She learned. When Jesus became the only one that mattered in her life, she learned from him. I think back to my young days and great days, great days of of, of just living for God, just simplicity. I, I think sometimes we need to get back to the simplicity of serving the Lord. But I think my young days, I'd, I'd go out there in the daytime. I remember Mama would fix sometimes for lunch, and, and she'd have it for supper. She'd have a big old pot of chicken and dumplings sitting in there uh, for us to eat. And I remember going in the house and eating lunch, and I'd come back out and get out of that old hickory nut tree and get my Bible. And I'd read and study and meditate in the Word of God, and try to find God, try to find answers to things in the Bible. And boy, God was dealing with me back in those days. And those are great days in my life. Looking back on it, that's the best days of my life. When I just sat at His feet and learned. Amen. And oh, listen, as time goes by, we get busy. And sometimes we as preachers, we forget to learn. Sometimes we as preachers, we forget to meditate in the Bible. We forget to just read a verse and see what it's saying. You know that? I mean, if you ain't careful, preacher, you'll, you'll get in such a hurry to do something. And you've got this to do and that to do. And you'll get tied up in this and that and this ministry and that ministry. And, and boy, you think you're beating the bushes. And when it comes down to the end of the way, you're going to realize that all you did was run around in circles. And I tell you something, amen, I, I want to I wanna learn something from God. I want to know God personally, don't you? I think about Revelation chapter number 3 a lot. I think about that verse in verse number uh, 20, I believe it is. Uh, he, he talked about, he said, he said, behold. Now this is talking to the saved person. It's not talking about losing your salvation here. But he said, behold, stop, pay attention. Now look, and I'm going to tell you something. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, I'm standing at your heart's door and I'm knocking. I'm walking in. Now, if somebody knocks at the door, uh, very seldom does anybody ever uh, come to my house and visit me. The other day, I, I was doing something. Somebody rang the doorbell. I thought the trumpet had already said no, but I mean, I, I, somebody rang the door. I, I went over there to the door. Sure enough, uh, a neighbor I'd never met was at the door. And uh, But anyway, here's here's the thing about that. And he had brought me something. Amen. Uh, uh, somebody had left a package at his house or something. And so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, he was he was rung that doorbell. You know why? He wanted my attention. He wanted me to open the door. And Jesus wants our attention. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, I believe that's any man that's saved by the grace of God, if any man will hear my voice and, and open the door, 
He said, and maybe I'm not quoting a word for it. He said, I will, I will come in and sup with him and he, he, and he with, with me. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to come in your heart. I'm going to talk to you about the things you want to talk about. And he said, then we're going to talk about the things I want to talk about. You know, I think about Adam and Eve in the garden. I believe they were in a, a perfect environment. Amen. Now, they were in a fleshly body, but they were in a perfect environment. I don't think they stayed too long before they sinned. But there's one thing they had. They had fellowship with God. Now, when Adam and Eve... Uh, committed the sin in the garden, and they took the fruit of the tree, and they ate of it, and Adam knew what he was doing. And uh, he, his eyes, he went into that thing wide open. His eyes are wide open. And when they did that, the very thing that got cut off was the fellowship of God. You remember, you remember God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, uh, he said, I hid myself. He said, because I was naked. And then God said, who told thee thou was naked? Amen. I mean, Adam knew something he wasn't supposed to know. And so it, it ruined the fellowship. The devil had played that up to Eve and, and told her, you know, oh, uh, uh, you know, if, if you'll just eat this tree, I mean, it's good for food. You're going to know good and evil. And he made that sound like a good thing. Let me tell you something, brother. God does not appeal to our intellect and our mind. The devil does that. The devil wants to to uh, to, to, uh, to have this thing about being smart and being intellectually uh, refined in the Scriptures and all that. Listen, I, I'll say this. Now listen to me. I believe every man ought to know his Bible. And I believe every woman ought to know their Bible. And I believe every young people ought to know, every person ought to know your Bible. But I'll tell you one thing, amen, the Bible appeals to the heart, amen. The Bible, the Bible works on the heart. And, and, and so uh, we have to understand that God works in simple things. God's not in all the high things of the world. Amen. And so, but, but the fellowship got cut off there. But you know what? You know what Mary did? The thing that mattered most to Mary was fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. And she learned from him. She learned from him. And I tell you what. So now, when Jesus is the only one that matters. Remember on Mount Transfiguration again? Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Peter wanted to build three tabernacles. Now, Peter was just excited. And, uh, and, the, and the Bible said that when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. You know what God did? God had to do a work in their lives and get them to the place to where Jesus was the most important person in their life. My friend, if God ever works on you, and God ever tries you, and God ever puts you through some test, you'll come out, amen, that Jesus is the most important person in your life. And when you come out with that attitude, and you come out with that, I tell you one thing, you'll get somewhere for God. Amen, you will. All right. Now, let's notice the second thing. Amen. The second thing I want you to notice, amen, not only did Mary learn from the Lord, but I say this, that John leaned on the Lord. Amen. John leaned on the Lord. Now, let me say what happened here. The apostle John, amen, He Jesus was the most important person to him. Now, they're sitting at supper, and Jesus is talking about the one that's going to betray him. In John 13, verse number 22, the Bible said, Then the disciples looked one, uh, uh, looked one on another. The Bible said, Doubting of, of whom he spake. Now, notice what happened here in verse number 23 of the book of John, chapter number 13. Now, there was, leaning on Jesus' breast, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. That was John. Amen. All right, verse number 24. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. In other words, he said, uh, Peter said, John. John, now you're sitting over there. John, John, ask him who is going to betray him. Now, wait a minute. Why could 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 why did Peter not ask the Lord himself? Let me tell you why. Because John at that point was closer to Jesus than Peter was. You know what happened? Now I don't know what Peter and the other disciples were doing. Maybe they were carried away. Maybe they were carried away about the uh, the, the idea of somebody betraying the Lord. But here's John. John's over there fellowshipping with him. John's over there just leaning up on him. There wasn't nothing immoral about that. He just, just like a fellow would pat a fellow on the back or something. John wanted to be around Jesus. Amen. And Jesus was the most important person in his life. Now, when Jesus becomes most important to you, remember again, on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now, when you see Jesus only, you'll learn from him. And when you see Jesus only, you will lean on him. Now, the idea of somebody leaning on somebody is for support. 
Amen. In other words, that involves trust. Now let me say, when you, when Jesus becomes most important in your life, you will trust Jesus Christ. I'm talking to people today, and you're burdened. I mean, you're troubled. You're like Martha. You're cumbered about many things. Many of you are cumbered and, and, and worried about the political climate in America. It, it is something to be concerned about. Our nation has drastically took a turn in the last few years. We're living in a demonic age. We're living in the day when the devil is just running wild and sin on every corner. Our preachers seem like they've run off into the world and nobody's interested in preaching on sin. Nobody's interested in standing. And everybody says they'll stand, but we're going to find out one of these days, I'm afraid. Amen. But here's the deal. I don't know. You don't know what you'll do. I don't know what I'd do. Amen. But here's the deal. Did you know that we are not to let this stuff bother us? We are, we are to trust in the Lord. Now, we're to pay attention to things. We're to pay attention to what's going on. But I tell you, our trust ought to be in God. My trust cannot be today in a political party. It will fail me. My trust cannot be in the United States Congress. It will fail me. My trust cannot be in the United States Supreme Court. I feel they've already failed me. Amen. And so I, 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 can't, I can't trust these institutions for, for, for my compassion complete trust. You know what I got to lean on? The Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus is the only one that matters. I'm not saying put your head in the sand. I'm not saying not pay attention to what's going on. I'm not saying not stand and vote. I'm not saying not do what's right. I'm not saying that at all. I think you ought to do what's right. I think you ought to take a stand. There are certain issues you need to take a stand on. But what I am saying to you, my friend, is this. Amen. Uh, that, uh, that, my friend, that, uh, that, 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 that there comes times when Amen. That uh, there comes times when, when you just got to lean in the, in, on the Lord. There comes times in your life. You're facing things in your life. Listen, uh, Mom and Daddy, there's, there's some of you out there right now. The Lord just, just want me to say this. There's some of you out there right now that, that your children are about to drive you crazy. And, and I want to say something. You, if they're grown, you can't make their decisions for them. All right? Uh, you, you can't do that. You can't make... There just, you can't spend your life making their decision. You say, preacher, I don't want to see them go down the wrong road. I've done everything I can do. What do I do? You pray and put it in the hands of God. This is the time when you need to let Jesus become most important in your life, and you need to lean on Him. Amen? Lean on Him. Trust on Him like John did. Amen? Have fellowship with Him. Pray. Get in your Bible. Some of you have followed a, a, a mama to the graveyard. Some of you have followed a daddy to the graveyard. Some of you have buried a cousin. Some of you have buried a wife or a husband. And boy, I tell you what, you, you, you just can't shake that. I mean, you can't get over that. By the way, you know, you'll never get over it. I want you to understand that. I'll never get over my mama as long as I live. I've got my good mind and my daddy. I'll never get over them. But my life goes on. And, and I know that's a little blunt. But you know, my mama always told me, she said, now son, when I die, she said, I don't want you to moon and mourn and spend days. You know what? I've got to go on with the work of God. God has left me a husband. If God's took your wife, I-, I talked to a dear man one day, and this man had wrote several books. Many of you, many of you preachers have this man's books in your libraries, and he was a great writer, and, and I-, I talked to him personally one day, and-, and this man's wife had just passed away, and the man was heartbroken. You could tell he's heartbroken. He's well up in age then, and he said, I'm having some issues here trying to get all these books published and my wife was my help now sitting down the hallway here in the next room is my wife god gave me a good wife a few years ago god gave me a good wife and and i i don't know what he'd be like to follow my wife's body to the graveyard i don't know what that'd be like i don't want to know what that'd be like oh that'd be so sad but i know this i know this god's grace is sufficient and whatever god does is right now listen listen to me god never does anything wrong you say preacher i i don't understand why God took my teenage daughter. I don't either. I don't either. But I say this to you in this hour, you ought to lean on the Lord. Don't lean on the psychologist. Don't lean on the uh, uh, on the psychiatrist. Don't lean on the medicine. Don't listen. What you need to do is take this Bible and go with the Bible. I, I was laying in that bed that morning. 
And my mama had asked me to preach her funeral. And mama had asked me to, to, to sing at her funeral. And I believe the singing was harder than the preaching. And, uh, and so that morning, I woke up. And it's a rainy sort of a drizzly morning in the month of May. And, and, and I was laying there in that bed that morning. And the Holy Ghost said, Now, Ricky, we can do this two ways today. He said, We can look at it fleshly or we can look at it spiritually. And boy, I grabbed a hold of the spirit world uh, of God. I'm talking, talking about something weird. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. I grabbed a hold of, of God and, and, and God helped me to realize that that little shell laying in that casket was just the pod and the peas had been shelled out and they'd gone to be with God and I went down to that Rhonda Baptist Tabernacle in Rhonda, North Carolina and preached that funeral with grace in my soul oh was I heart broke, sure but I tell you one thing friend God gave me grace, amen, why when Jesus becomes the only one in your life, sometimes God does things to get you to just lean on Him. Sometimes God has to take the Uzziahs out of our life. Did you know that? Sometimes God has to take the rough places out of your life. Sometimes you're leaning to, to a friend more than you are God. God has to separate that. He sure does. I tell you, you we need to get to the place. Those disciples, I mean, it, it, it had to be a good thing for Peter and James and John to see Moses and Elijah. Well, I've never seen Moses and Elijah. One day I will, but I hadn't seen them yet, and it'd be good. Now, they couldn't talk to him, and I'm not going to get into the reasons why they couldn't talk to him, but uh, Moses and Elijah never talked to Peter, James, and John. They never came to talk to Peter, James, and John. They talked to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so they talked to him, and, 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 and they talked about Calvary, I believe. I believe that's what they're talking about. And so here's the thing about it. Peter got carried away, and Peter was excited, and Peter was glad, and so he redirected his marks to the Lord and said, Lord, if it be thy will, and you know, I told you that, build three tabernacles. Well, wait a minute. He had his eyes on the Lord and Moses and Elijah. Well, you can't have your eyes on the Lord and somebody. Now, some folk have their eyes on the Lord and their preacher. You know, it's just, well, my preacher said this, and my preacher said that, and my preacher said this, and my preacher. Let me tell you something, folks. Some people are worshiping their preacher more than they are God, all right? Now, I believe in the preacher. I believe in the man of God. I believe in respecting the man of God. I believe in obeying the man of God. But I tell you one thing. I'm not going to put any man of God up there equal with God, all right? Right? I believe in you following your preacher, but worshiping God. Amen. You follow the preacher, but you worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And many people worship their preacher. They put him up. Though my preacher said, it's not necessarily what your preacher said. It's what the Bible says. Amen. What does the Word of God say about it? Amen. And you say, well, my preacher wouldn't lead me wrong. Well, uh, you always ought to have the Bible. There always ought to be checks and balances. Amen. Otherwise, you got problems. But let me say this to you: when you, when Jesus becomes the only one important to you. Old John just leaned on his breast. You know, I don't know what Peter, James, and John were doing there in that room, or Peter and James and Andrew and all of them. Maybe they were, maybe they were uh, more interested in who was going to betray him. John was interested in Jesus. Amen. John was interested in the right thing. I tell you, when you get interested in the right thing, you'll lean on God. Amen. When Jesus becomes most important to you. Amen. Now, the third thing I want you to look at, I want you to, I want you to see that Mary, uh, she learned from Jesus. He become most important in her life, and she learned from him. And then I want you to notice that, uh, that John, amen, he leaned on him. He trusted in him. He was most important. Then I think about a third man in the Old Testament. This man's name is Noah. And, and boy, I tell you what, you know what Noah did? Noah looked to him. Now, when God has given Noah the specifications for building the ark, in Genesis 6, 16, he said, A window shalt thou make, uh, the Bible said, to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou fashion it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, uh, with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. Now here's a God telling Noah that it's going to rain. Now it had never rained on the earth before. All right, never had. And for 120 years, this man preached righteousness. For 120 years, he is out there working on that ark. Now you know that man was laughed at. You know that his boys were laughed at. I mean, he suffered great persecution. I mean, somebody passed by and said, there's that gang of Noah's out there, and they're building on that on that thing again. 
and whatever that thing is, and they said it's going to rain or do something, and, and we ain't never heard of no such like that. And, boy, we don't know about this preacher. I tell you what, now, I don't know where he's coming from, but he's out there building some kind of thing and said it's going to rain. You know what? One day he got it finished, and one day God said, come on the inside, and that window was in the top of that thing, and one day there's some clouds got to rolling up in the sky, and somebody probably looked at somebody else and said, man, the sky kind of looks funny today. It ain't blue today. It's kind of gray. One fellow said, hey, I feel something coming out of the sky. One man said, hey, didn't that preacher over there say that water is going to fall from the sky? They said, "Uh uh-oh, he told the truth. We better get over out of that ark. And boy, they started getting over there. Here they come. They started beating on that thing. They started climbing on the sides of it. They started climbing on the top of it. I mean, man, there's a hanging on. Noah, Noah, open that door. Open the door. Noah said, I can't open the door. God shut the door. I can't can't open it. God, I didn't close it. God closed the door. Let me say, when God closes the door to salvation, it's closed for him. You keep you keep thumbing your nose in God's face. And one of these days, the door of salvation will be closed to you. But you know what Noah did? He got in that ark and it began to rain. God opened the windows of heaven. Now Noah had three sons. And Noah had a wife. And those three sons had wives. And there's every kind of animal, every kind of herb, everything is in that one ark. It's a miracle. That ark's a miracle. It's a floating miracle. And yet, my friend, Noah could not look out. Noah couldn't look out and see what was going on. Now, it, it's man's it's man's uh, nature to look out at something. It's man's nature, if he's in a building, to want a window. It's man's nature to do that. But Noah could not do that. You know, the only way Noah could look was up. Amen. The only way Noah could look, you know what all Noah seen every time he looked up was the sky. Listen, brother, did you know there's many times God just wants us to look up? I had a friend of mine. He's in heaven now, and uh, and uh, he used to say this, things are looking up. Things are looking up. That's what he'd say. Things are looking up. Let me tell you something, brother. God wants you and I to look up when Jesus, you know what Jesus did in Noah's life? Jesus was the only one that was important. He had preached for Jesus for 120 years. What a great ministry. By the way, had not one convert in 120 years. Boy, most preachers would have resigned that outfit. Amen. By the way, he had not one offering took for him in 120 years. Most preachers would have definitely resigned that outfit. He had not one paid base. Vacation. They didn't give him one new car, not in 120 years. No, sir, no, sir. Nobody listened to him. Matter of fact, nobody probably ever even come by to hear him preach. But anyway, he just kept a preaching. And now he's leaning on God. Now he's in this ark. And now he's floating along. And now the only way he can look is up, preacher, you're in that church. And I tell you, the deacons are giving you trouble. And it's just trouble on every hand. And the money uh, 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 is getting ready to dry up and people's threatening to leave. And uh, boy, it's, it's all big of a mess. But let me let me say, what you do is you look to Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't tell you how to handle your situation. I don't know how. I don't know your situation. There are some things I don't have an answer for. But you've just got to look to God. You've got to look to Jesus Christ. And there are some things that you cannot question. You're just going to have to look to Him. I mean, Mary learned from Him. And John leaned on Him. And Noah looked to Him in that hour. He just looked to Him, brother. That's all he could do. I remember several years ago now many years ago now, I was pastoring a church, uh, and uh, and my deacon called me one Saturday evening, and he said, Preacher, there's been a terrible accident. He said, and this preacher that me and him knew, he was a preacher friend of mine, and this deacon said, and he said, there's been a terrible accident. He said, this preacher's grown son has been killed in an automobile accident this afternoon. And, and, and that preacher, boy, and, and, and the deacon said, you want to go over there and see him? I said, yeah, come by the house and get me. And, and we go to that preacher's house. And i never forget it. Now, the preacher was quite a large man, and 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 he was he was, he was and I'm I'm a little bitty fella. I walked in that door. That preacher was my buddy. Me and him had rode the roads together. Me and him had preached together. I'd preached in his church when he pastored, and and and, and I, I I don't know if and, and and I mean me and him. I don't know if we ever done a meeting at the same night or not. But I mean me and him had uh, we we was we, we was buddies. I mean he'd preach and and I'd preach and and and, and I and, and we were buddies. And I walked in there that night. There's his son gone. There's his family sitting around. They don't know what to do. You know what I did? I did something I've never done in my life. I went over, I'm a grown man. I, I'm 40 years old. I, I, I think I'm 41 year old at that time. You know what I did? I went over and crawled up in that man's lap. He's big enough he could hold me. I just crawled up in his lap. I just sat there in his lap, just crawled up in his lap and sat down. You know what? I didn't have the words to say to him. Sometimes preachers, we ain't got the right words. 
No, sir. Sometimes you go down to visit a family member and maybe somebody's blowed their brains out and committed suicide. And you don't know how to you don't know how to reach that family. You don't know what to say. Words can't describe. And you don't know what to say. You know, about the only thing you can do is look to Jesus. The only thing you can do is look to God. My friend, listen, don't ever question God in a situation like that. Oh, but if God loved me, He wouldn't. No, if God loved me, He didn't. No, 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 no. God's always right. You see, Noah could have said, hey, wait a minute. God, you're not right. You just destroyed the whole earth, and I'm on this boat, and I don't even know if I'm going to get off here, and I'm just looking to you. But listen, Noah believed God. And Noah's got to start all over. The whole world's got to start all over by Noah. God used that one man. By the way, God don't always call us to do easy things. You see, we look at those people in the Bible, and we call them characters. I I don't like that word Bible characters, but if you use it, I'm not mad at you. But we call them characters. And and we we think that every one of them had a snazzy life. We think that, oh, I'd love to have been Noah. I'd love to have been Daniel. Would you really? Now, come on, would you really love to have been Noah and you preach for 120 years and nobody, and, you, and nobody, nobody come to hear you preach? And then you get on an ark and you're on there with all your sons and your sons' wives and your wife and all the animals and you don't know what's going to, I mean, I mean, your flesh, the Bible said that Elijah was as like passions as we are. I mean, Noah gets on there, he's flesh like everybody else. And it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. I believe Noah believed God, he sure did. But but let me tell you something. Noah was just a man too. But you know what Noah did? Noah looked to God. Noah didn't question God. No doubt Noah had other family died in that flood. You ever thought about that? Noah's wife had family. Their family didn't even appreciate them enough to even hear what Noah was saying. I mean, Noah's wife had a mom and daddy. Where was she at? Amen. I mean, listen, Noah could have had a mom and daddy. He did have a mom and daddy. Where were they at? Amen. I mean, listen, I tell you, where was his kinfolk? Amen. Did Noah have brothers? Where were they? Amen. I mean, could they have said, our brother's gone crazy? I, I, I mean, is that what they said about you when you started preaching? Why, he's gone crazy. He don't fit in with us anymore. Why, he don't drink and cuss and fight with us. Why, he got Satan. He don't fit in with us anymore. And, and, and boy, your whole family just changed. And listen, the devil will use that on you. The devil say, why, boy, I tell you what, listen, I, I want to say this to you. you. You may lose some family when you get saved. Amen? Listen, you can't hang around your drunk brothers and sisters when you're saved. You can witness to them, but you can't run with that crowd. You'll get back and see it. You can't do that. And so Noah looked to God. There's times you go out to look to God. There's times I don't have the answer. There's times man don't have the answer, but the Bible has the answer for you. There's people right now. And you're facing great medical situations. I heard about somebody the other day that's facing an impossible medical situation. I mean, it's it's very bad. It's not impossible, but it's, but it's, but it's, it's really a serious situation. And brother, I don't have the answer for that. I hear about people that has two and three different kinds of cancer. I hear about people that have cancer and then their wife has problems. Or maybe the wife has cancer and the husband had problems. I heard about somebody, both of them had cancer. And brother, I don't know how to deal with that. I don't have words to describe that. But all I got to tell you is learn from him. Lean on him. Look to him. When Jesus becomes the only one that's important in your life, they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, Mo- and they saw Moses and Elijah. And then when, when Jesus touched them and they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. In the year King Isaiah died, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. Let me ask you a question. When God clears everything out of your life, will you just see Jesus only? When Jesus is the only thing that matters. What matters to you in your life? You say, well, preacher, my wife matters to me more than anything in the world. Well, you got her in the wrong place. You see, when my husband matters to me more than anything in the world, my kids matter to me more than anything in the world. You got them in the wrong place. You got a Uzziah set up there. Jesus must be number one. Jesus must be number one. You know, well, what if God calls your kids to go to the mission field? Are you going to get mad at Jesus about that? Why, you can't take my grandbabies over there. Why, you can't leave me. You can't take my daughter over there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You got family in the wrong position. Jesus is the one who's supposed to be most important in your life, not family, not friends, not wealth, not riches, not places. Jesus. You say, preacher, I'm just not there yet. Well, you won't ever do much for God. You may think you will, and you may, you may have a name that you will, but until you put Him first, you've got to have God number one. And you've got to just say, did you know I don't live where I want to? 
By the way, I like where I live, and I mean, I reckon I do live where I want to, but what I'm saying to you is this, it is not my choice to live in North Carolina. If God told me to go to North Dakota or South Dakota or Nebraska or Oregon or Mississippi or Alabama, I'd go. Now, my wife is from Mississippi, and I'm from North Carolina. Now, she had to move up here. And by the way, I believe the lady ought to always follow the man. Amen. I'm a little leery of the fella following the girl. I have never have seen that work too well. I'll be honest. You young preacher boys, when you get married, if you follow the girl to her church, I've never seen that work out too good. Now, people don't like that. don't like me to say that. But I'll tell you right now, amen, the girl's to follow the guy. And if that girl ain't willing to follow you... And then you got a problem, amen. She'll never be a good preacher's wife. She's going to have to get the rebellion out of her life and get some things out of her life, amen. Now, there may be certain situations. I, I, I can't judge everybody's situation. There may be certain situations where, where you would go to her church. But I'll tell you right now, as a general rule, I've never seen that work. But my wife followed me to North Carolina. Now, listen, it ain't, it ain't that my family's from North Carolina and I was raised in North Carolina. I'm going to live in North Carolina. It ain't that at all. God's just left me in North Carolina. God said, that's where you work from. That's what I want you to do. And believe you me, I've tried to leave. Amen. God said, no. So I'm, I'm just simply telling you, I'm to look to God. You're to look to God. Now, Mary. Mary learned from him. And then we had John leaned on him. And then we had Noah look to him. And then I will say number four, Daniel was loyal to him. Daniel was loyal because of him. Daniel was loyal. You know, you know what happened to Daniel? Daniel was a young man. Let me give you the story on Daniel. Daniel's a young man. Now Israel and, 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 and Judah is wicked as the devil. And now Judah's getting ready to go into Babylonian captivity. Israel had already gone into captivity. They were gone. The nation of Israel had already fallen at this time. And now Judah's getting ready to go into captivity. And, and uh, we believe that Daniel was from the seed of, of Hezekiah. And uh, Daniel was kidnapped and taken to Babylon. Daniel was a young man. Daniel was probably forced to be a eunuch. Daniel was, Daniel was probably uh, mistreated somewhat. And there he is in Babylon. Now Daniel didn't have a bad attitude. He didn't write a letter to King Nebuchadnezzar telling him how bad he had had it. You know what Daniel did? He was loyal because of the Lord. Now, if it had been any of us, we'd have said, Lord, you done me wrong. And you took me over here at a young age. And Lord, you know, everybody wants to take up for kids. Oh, we don't want kids to have a hard life. And I don't want kids to have a hard life. Some of y'all think I'm mean about young people. I'm not mean. But let me tell you something. My hard days in my youth, it helped me. Amen. It helped me. And let me say, Lamentations talks about bearing the yoke in your youth, amen. And, and some people believe that means, you know, work in your youth. And I, it probably does mean that. But I also, it, it don't hurt you to bear some trials in your youth. You young folks should not be a bunch of spoiled little old kids that sit around and play video games all day and have mama hand you all kind of money. Listen, if you're living that kind of life, you're not going to do much for Jesus Christ. But Daniel didn't live that kind of life. Daniel had some things put in his heart when he was young. I don't know if it's Daniel's mama, Daniel's daddy, Daniel's grandma. I don't know. But somebody put some things in Daniel's heart at a young age. You know what Daniel was? He was loyal because of him. You know why? Because on the way to Babylon, Daniel realized that Jesus is the only one that matters. Daniel said, Daniel said in his heart, they may take me out of my country and they may try to change the way I live, but I'll be loyal to my God. They may take me away. They destroyed the house of God. No doubt Daniel could have been there that day and saw the temple being burned with fire. He could have been. And brother, no doubt, those Jews saw their temple and those that loved the Lord, those that really loved God, oh, it just about killed them on the inside to see that temple be burned. But now here's Daniel in a strange land down there. Oh, he's down there. He's in a strange land now. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Now the king, by the way, had said, now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these fellows. And he said, you bring me some of these Jews and bring me the best of them, bring me the brightest of them. He said, I'm going to nourish them with my meat and my drink. Now, I believe that was probably wine. And Daniel said, I'm not going to drink strong drink. And I believe it was also pig meat. Now, you can say what you want to, but I believe it's hog meat. By the way, we can, we're not under law, so we can't eat hog meat today. If you want to eat it, it's really not good for you, but you can't eat it. But here's the deal. Here's what Daniel said. Now, Daniel wasn't a Pharisee. Daniel wasn't ugly. By the way, we ought not be ugly. and You don't, you don't have to be ugly in taking a stand. No, sir, you don't have to be ugly and taking a stand. And let, let me just give you a little story before I do that. In high school, I just determined in my heart, now Mama didn't tell me this, but I determined in my heart that, uh, that I was going to, uh, 
uh, uh, dress right in the physical education class. And I wasn't going to put my shorts on and go walking around the gym and all that. And I, so I, I went up to the guidance counselor at school. And I didn't go up there and threaten him. I just said, sir, I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't address that way. He said, that ain't no problem, Ricky. Now, there were people that told me, he said, you can't get by with that. But let me say this to you, God worked it out. And I went in there, and because I dressed right in that class, now, I wasn't a preacher at that time, but people called me preacher. And I had one boy, he come to me and said, pray for me. I'll never forget that. Let me tell you something, friend. People respect you when you dress right if you don't force it down their throat. Now, I know we preach a lot of dress standards, okay? And in my young days, I was a preaching stuff just to get people to amen me. Now, if you don't dress the way I think you ought to, and I see you coming down the street, I'm not going to switch sides of the street to keep from speaking to you, okay? I'm not that kind of fella. I'm not going, by the way, God's not in that at all. I'm going to respect you as a, as, as a Christian, and, and I'm go, but, but I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to still preach what this Bible says about dressing and standing for God and doing the right things. Amen. Now here's what Daniel said in Daniel 1.8. But Daniel purposed where in his heart. Now a lot of people get convictions in their head. They'll go to a meeting and they'll get stirred up and some fellow preach against social media and they'll go home and shoot their phone. Or some fellow preach against TV and they'll go home and put a bullet in it. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're sincere about that, it's okay. But in five years, if you're going to go back and get another, you'd been better off not done that. You know what you did? You had it in your head, not in your heart. Now listen, there's the convictions I got in my heart. There's some that God put in my heart years ago. I'm not mad at you, but I was up at the river. I got saved in 78. And I was in the river up there uh, playing around the water. When I first got saved, hadn't been up there. Hadn't been saved just a few months. And the Holy Ghost said to me, Ricky, what are you doing up here dressed like that? I, ne- I never took my shirt off again in public. I never put a pair of shorts on again in public. Why? Because God convicted me of that. It's in my heart, you see. Now Daniel had it in his heart. Now notice what he said. He said in verse 8, Daniel 1, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, watch this, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You know what he did? He requested. He did. And by the way, by the way, Daniel come out on the winning end of the stick. Did you know that? Daniel came out on the winning end of the stick. Did you know they, they nursed him with, with paws and water, vegetables? And brother, after 10 days, Daniel was fairer and looked better, him and, him and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, than them others did. Amen. And Daniel, be by the way, by the way, because Daniel was loyal because of him. You know what happened? Daniel realized that Jesus was the only important thing in his life. It doesn't say that Daniel's daddy went to Babylon. It doesn't say that Daniel's mother went to Babylon. If Daniel had sisters or brothers, it doesn't say that they went to Babylon. Daniel was kidnapped and went to Babylon at a young age. And, da- and by the way, Daniel was kidnapped out of a land of idolatry and idol worship and wickedness in Judah. And Daniel left that. But the whole time, Daniel said, I'm going to serve God. So let me say this about today that we're living in. We still have some people today that love the Lord. We still have some young preachers that want to preach the Word of God. I want to help you men. I want to encourage you men. If I can ever be of help to you, please contact me. I want to help you men preach the Bible. I want to help you. I want to love you. I I, I want to see a new generation spring up for God in the day and hour in which we live. We've got some young people that love the radio. I wish some of you young people would write me a letter and let me know that you're listening, and I'll tell you why. That way I can, I can let people know that we got a whole crowd of young people listening. Amen. I got young families that listen to me on the radio. It's not just older folk. Now, I thank God for our older generation. I believe they do relate to what I preach. But let me tell you something, brother. We need the power of the Holy Ghost again. And Daniel was loyal because of him. You know why Daniel loved Because Jesus is the only one to matter. You, you know why I live for God? Not a bunch of list of rules of do's and don'ts. I don't get up every once and say, well, I've checked rule number 37 off. I didn't chew tobacco this morning. I uh, well, I checked no rule number 316 off. I didn't smoke a cigarette this morning. No, sir, no, sir. No, by the way, I don't smoke and I don't chew. But let me say this to you. I don't, I don't live for God to check off a list of rules. I live for God because God is holy. I live for God because He died on Calvary's cross. He was beaten unrecognizably. All His bones were, were out of joint. 
I live for God because on the first day of the week He arose for my sin and took them away. I live for God because He's the greatest that they are in the whole world. I live for God because nobody ever cared for me like Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And I live for Him because I love Him. And I can honestly say He's the most important one in my life. Therefore, I want to learn from Him. Therefore, I want to lean on Him. Therefore, I want to look to Him. And therefore, I want to be loyal because of Him. Number five. And I close with this one. Number five. I take you to the Apostle Paul. You see, nobody was more important in the life of Paul than Jesus Christ. Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was a legalist. Paul Paul had people killed. Saul did. He murdered people. He was on his way to Damascus to uh, persecute a bunch of Christians when Jesus saved him. But when Jesus saved that dear man... There was nobody like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. There's not a preacher ever been that fully gave his life for the cause of Christ like Paul did. You know what Paul did? Because Jesus was most important, because he saw no man save Jesus only. You know what Paul did? Paul lived for him. Paul lived a life, amen, that was pleasing unto God. Philippians chapter 1 verse 21 says, For, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. You know what Paul is saying? I'm going to, I, I'm, if I live, I'm going to serve the Lord. Whether it's in prison, whether it ain't, whether they beat me, whether they kill me, whatever they do to me, I'm going to, I'm going to serve the Lord. For me, I'm all in this thing of serving God. I'm all in this thing of getting churches started. I'm all in this thing of getting people saved. I'm not half in. I'm not just in on Sunday. I'm there. I'm going to live for God. Paul said, for me to live, to me to live is Christ. If I live, it's going to be Christ. And to die is gain. In other words, the worst thing, the best thing that happened to me is death. One fellow pulled a gun on one of the old preachers one time. Pulled a gun on him. I believe it's Dr. R.G. Lee. Somebody pulled a gun on him. He said, son, he said, you can't threaten me with heaven. Amen. Let me tell you something, brother. You, you, listen, you say, I'll kill you. Well, let me say this. You just give me a, a, a ride on into the presence of God. Amen. I tell you, for me to live this Christ and to die is gain. And if you live your life like that, I, if I live, I'm going to serve the Lord. And if I die, I'm going to gain heaven. I'm going to gain. And then Paul wrote that great verse in one of his last epistles, in probably the last epistle he wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, that great verse, I have fought a good fight. Boy, he did fight a fight, didn't he? I've finished my course. Boy, there ain't many people going to be able to say that. I've kept the faith. He said, I've finished, Lord, what you give me to do. I've stood with all the doctrines. I've not compromised. I've not had a revelation and said, well, I see this different now. You know, a lot of preachers say, well, I've seen the light on that. I've seen it different. I've been preaching 40 years. Now, I, I'll say that I hope I'm wiser in 40 years than I was 40 years ago. And I hope I'm preaching with more compassion than I was 40 years ago. But there's doctrines in this Bible that I believe 40 years ago. I still believe that. I believe tithing 40 years ago, and I believe it now. I believe being faithful to the house of God 40 years ago, and I believe it now. I, 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 I believe it was a sin for a man to commit adultery 40 years ago, and I believe it is now. I, I believe that homosexuality was a sin 40 years ago. I believe it is now. I believe gambling, cussing, fighting, cheating, lying. I believe it's a sin 40 years ago, and I believe it is now. I believe drinking liquor was a sin 40 years ago, and drinking beer, and I believe it is now. I ain't changed my mind. The Bible ain't changed this mind. But let me say this to you, friend. You know, I want to I I live for God, don't you? I want to live my life for Him. God put me here on this earth to live for Him. Now, God wants me to enjoy the earth. God wants me to enjoy the summertime, the springtime, the fall time. God wants me to enjoy things on this earth. I enjoy gardens. I enjoy vegetables. I enjoy sunny days. I enjoy watermelon. I enjoy ice cream. Not supposed to be eating much of it, but I enjoy it. Amen. And I want to tell you, I enjoy the life. I do. I laugh, have a good time. Some folk don't like that in me, but I have a good time. I'm going to live for God. And by the grace of God, I don't know what's coming on America. But when Jesus is most important, you know what? In, in Mary's life, Jesus is most important, and she learned from him. In John's life, Jesus was most important, and he leaned on him. In uh, my friend, in Noah's life, he was, Jesus was most important, and Noah looked to him. In Daniel's life, Jesus was most important, and Daniel was loyal because of him. And in Paul's life, Jesus was most important, and Paul lived for him. When Jesus is the only one that matters. When Jesus is the only one that matters. The Bible said they saw no man. Peter was wanting to build three tabernacles. But brother, when it was all said and done, the Bible said they saw no man 
save Jesus only. Where are you today? What's hindering you from serving God? You say, preacher, my wife's hindering me. She won't go to church. Go without her. You say, preacher, my husband's hindering me. I just don't want to go without him. Go anyhow. My mama went to church without my daddy. If she had not went without my daddy, I would not have gotten saved. My mama took two little boys to church without their daddy going. And by the way, by the way, those two boys are in church today. Listen to me. Listen to me. You serve the Lord no matter what. No matter how hard it gets, no matter what happens, you serve the Lord in some capacity. And God will bless your heart. Amen. I close with this. I was talking with a preacher the other day. This preacher told a story many years ago, and I told it on the radio many years ago. This preacher told a story about this young man that announced his call to preach, and, and they were going, him and his wife had gotten married. They are going to law school. And this lady said to this preacher, she said, I, I'm, I'm just not going to be married to a preacher. I'm, I'm going to su- pursue my law career. Well, she ended his preaching right there. She ended that. And I, I won't argue about that, but she ended that. That man went on, and he's saved by the grace of God. And you know what? That man got in another church in another state. He just went on. I don't know how he ended up where he was. But that man, that man got him a business, and he started making quite a bit of money. Maybe he ended up being a lawyer. And the preacher said that every Sunday morning, that man would go down to the restaurant and get ham and biscuits or, or have them made or something on Saturday. So I don't know how he did it, but he'd bring them to feed the bus kids that they brought into the church on Sunday. That man did a great work for God. Now, that man couldn't preach. That man found his place. And by the way, by the way, circumstances may dictate that you can't do what you wanted to do. But you can always do something for God. Find that thing that you can do for God and do it. Father, take this message. Use it for your glory. I know I'll answer for it again in the judgment. In Jesus' name I pray this prayer. Amen.